Chapter eighty six of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Bradshaw. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter eighty six. Anne Radcliffe. Born seventeen sixty four. Died eighteen twenty three. Edinburgh Review. Born in 1764, died in 1823, this lady was as truly an inventor, a great and original writer in the department she had struck out for herself, whether that department was of the highest kind or not, as the Richardsons, Fieldings, or Smollett's whom she succeeded, and for a time threw into the shade, or the Ariosto of the North, before whom her own star has paled its ineffectual fires. The passion of fear the latent sense of supernatural awe and curiosity concerning whatever is hidden and mysterious, these were themes and sources of interest which, prior to the appearance of her tales, could scarcely be said to have been touched upon. The castle of Otranto was too obviously a mere caprice of imagination. Its gigantic helmets, its pictures descending from their frames, its spectral figures dilating themselves in the moonlight to the height of the castle battlements, if they did not border on the ludicrous, no more impressed the mind with any feeling of awe than the enchantments and talismans, the genii and peeries of the Arabian Nights. A nearer approach to the proper tone of feeling was made in the old English baron, but while it must be admitted that Mrs. Radcliffe's principle of composition was to a certain degree anticipated in that clever production, nothing can illustrate more strongly the superiority of her powers, the more poetical character of her mind, than a comparison of the way in which in her different works the principle is wrought out, the comparative boldness and rudeness of Clara Reeve's mode of exciting superstitious emotions, as contrasted with the profound art, the multiplied resources, the dexterous display and concealment, the careful study of that class of emotions on which she was to operate, which Mrs. Radcliffe displays in her supernatural machinery. Certainly never before or since did any one more accurately perceive the point to which imagination might be wrought up by a series of hints, glimpses, or half-hearted sounds, consistently at the same time with pleasurable emotion, and with the continuance of that very state of curiosity and awe which had been thus excited. The clang of a distant door, a footfall on the stair, a half-effaced stain of blood, a stream of music floating over a wood, or round some decaying chateau, nay, a very rat behind the arras, become in her hands, invested with a mysterious dignity, so finely has the mind been attuned to sympathise with the terrors of the sufferer by a train of minute details and artful contrasts, in which all sights and sounds combine to awaken and render the feeling more intense. Yet her art is more visible in what she conceals than in what she displays. One shade the more, one ray the less, would have left the picture in darkness. But to let in any farther the garish light of day upon her mysteries would have shown at once the hollowness and meanness of the puppet which alarmed us, and have broken the spell beyond the power of reclasping it. Hence, up to the moment when she chooses to do so herself by those fatal explanations for which no reader will ever forgive her, she never loses her hold on the mind. The very economy with which she avails herself of the talisman of terror preserves its power to the last undiminished, if not increased. She merely hints at some fearful thought, and leaves the excited fancy, surrounded by night and silence, to give it colour and form. Of all the passions, that of fear is the only one which Mrs. Radcliffe can be properly said to have painted. More wearisome beings than her heroines, and anything more tolerable and not to be endured than her love-tales, Calprenade or Scuderi never invented. As little have the sterner passions of jealousy or hatred, or the dark shades of envious and malignant feeling, formed the subjects of her analysis. Within the circle of these passions, indeed, she did not feel that she could walk with security, but her quick perception showed where there was still an opening in a region of obscurity and twilight as yet all but untrodden. To that, as to the sphere pointed out to her by nature, she at once addressed herself. From that, as from a central point, she surveyed the provinces of passion and imagination, and was content if, without venturing into their labyrinths, 
she could render their leading and more palpable features available to set off and to brighten by their variety the solemnity and gloom of the department which she had chosen. End of chapter 86 Recording by Jenny Bradshaw